Thanks, Barbara. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me. And I should say before I start that, Barbara, you've done a fantastic job on this conference. Um, I've been listening throughout the day. I've been busy doing some other stuff uh, from time to time, but dropping in and out. And it's been fantastic so far. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a, a really great thing to do in this very difficult time for all of us. What I'm going to talk about today is um, some work that we've been doing in my group over the last probably about year to 18 months or so, really. Um, it all started from uh, some work that I was kind of playing around with, which I'm going to kind of go through um, at the beginning of the talk, uh, where we were trying to find um, a way of measuring uh, habitual behaviour in zebrafish, so kind of stereotypic behaviour. Now, uh, fortuitously, during our search for a, a nice way of measuring uh, repetitive, stereotypic, habitual behaviour, um, we came across uh, this rather nice way of, of carrying out analysis using a, a simple Y maze. And since then, we've um, managed to, to model um, a lot of aspects of zebrafish memory using this tool. And so really what I want to talk about today is how we've come to that, um, some of the data that we've got and where we're hoping to go with it in the future. So what I've called the talk is uh, the free movement pattern Y maze, so the FMP Y maze, and that's what I'm going to refer to the, the task we've got um, throughout the talk um, for working memory assessment in zebrafish. So really, um, again, we're looking at how we started working with this uh, method of analysis to look at working memory um, and the pharmacology and translational relevance. I'm going to talk to you about some of the pharmacological assessments we've done um, in order to uh, assess whether this task is actually testing memory uh, and then also the translational relevance. So how this fits um, to other animal models, but also to humans. So uh, um, hopefully I can demonstrate all of that tonight. Um, before we start, I do apologise for advertising, but um, I know there are quite a few of you who are watching this who are in lockdown around the world. Um, as well as doing zebrafish work, my lab, we're very interested in uh, addiction and uh, the processes that underlie uh, particularly alcohol use and um, uh, addiction to alcohol. Um, and we're cor uh, currently running a large scale study, which some of you I'm sure are already taking part in because Barbara probably knows many of you and has asked you to take part. Um, but if anyone is not yet taking part, um, if they go to uh, parkerlab.com, hold on, uh, where are we, parkerlab, parkerlab.com there, um, then you can get more information about the task and um, that would uh, be really useful to us. So if you wouldn't mind, um, that would be fantastic. Okay, so um, in my lab, uh, what we try to do and sort of the basis of our work is really based on trying to find a precision psychiatry. And what I mean by that is trying to find specific individual traits or specific individual biomarkers that are related to aspects of psychiatric disorder. Now, the reason we do this is because, as I'm sure you know, treatment options for neuropsychiatric disorders are very limited. And even where we do have uh, treatment options for neuropsychiatric disorders, they're often very limited in terms of their clinical uh, efficacy. Um, most of the pharmacological treatments, for example, for uh, typical psychiatric disorders um, are really quite limited in terms of their uh, therapeutic efficacy. And when you look at large scale systematic reviews, there's really not been any significant improvement in the last 60 years. And most of these treatments are at best described as palliative. So in other words, they may treat the symptoms of the disorder, but they don't really get to the uh, underlying causes. Now, partly this is due to the fact that obviously psychiatric disorders have a large psychosocial component to them, but there's also fairly clear evidence that we don't fully understand the biology of a lot of psychiatric disorders. And that lack of understanding of the fundamental biology, in our view, is why we have a lack of precision in treatment options. Now, what we try to do in my lab is adopt a approach that looks at transdiagnostic neurocognitive phenotypes. Now what I mean by transdiagnostic is that we look at behavioural mainly but also uh, neural characteristics, neural circuits and so on, um, that underlie a series of different symptoms and underlying features that are transdiagnostic to a number of different disorders. We're particularly interested in neurocognitive phenotypes, in other words behaviours or cognitive patterns that have a well-defined biological signature to them. 
Now, as I've already mentioned in this evening's talk, I'm going to be concentrating mainly on memory. Now, memory is a complex system, as I'm sure you know, um, and consists of many different subcompartments, long term, short term memories, uh, sensory memories and so on. But what we're particularly interested in, and because the reason we're interested in this is because it does have links to a number of different uh, neuropsychiatric conditions, is more in terms of kind of working memory and how that feeds into executive function. Now, we know that there are memory in terms of working memory and executive function deficits in a number of different neuropsychiatric conditions. These include things like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and of course, schizophrenia. There's also evidence that memory is affected in a number of neurodevelopmental disorders. That includes, for example, things like um, prenatal alcohol syndrome. Of course, there are also memory deficits associated with neurodegenerative conditions. So the dementias, things like Parkinson's disease, uh, Alzheimer's and so on. So memory is particularly interesting in terms of transdiagnostic phenotypes because it is something that spans a number of different conditions. Now, before I start talking about our memory work specifically, I really just wanted to give you, those of you that have not heard me talk before, um, an overview of how we started doing some of this uh, work in terms of automation. Now, when I first started working with Zebrafish, which was um, a about 10 years or so, or roughly 10 years ago now, um, I was working in the lab of uh, Caroline Brennan, Professor Caroline Brennan, who's based at Queen Mary University in London. And Caroline had just got a large scale grant from the National Centre for the three R's, so the refinement, reduction and replacement of animals in research, uh, in order to try to find automated behavioural procedures for uh, zebrafish um, that were able to look into neurocognitive phenotypes that were related to addiction. So when I first started working with zebrafish back in around 2010, there was really very little in terms of automation. Now we've heard today um, some of the new uh, kind of funky ways that we can do um, uh, behavioural automation using apps and, and using, um, as Callaway spoke about earlier today, about using mobile phone cameras and, and, and algorithms that have been written and are open source. And that's all fantastic. But sadly, none of that existed 10 years ago. Um, so um, these pictures uh, show you some of the uh, equipment that we used in some of our early work. Um, these included, for example, modified mouse cages with um, uh, bits of plastic stuck inside them uh, and bits of paper uh, laminated and put behind the plastic and lights inside uh, dropper pipettes uh, on uh, LED lights attached to sort of lighting rigs and so on um, and you can see in the bottom right there the uh, uh, the picture of the fish swimming around in one of our in one of our modified mouse cages for an early paper that we did. Now, actually, this work was really quite fruitful and we published a number of studies using these kind of non-automated procedures. But it became very quickly obvious that in order to get reliability um, and also in order to increase our throughput, um, we needed to have more automation. And so really what we started to do was look into ways that um, software and hardware could be automated either using what existed currently um, or by um, trying to work with companies that were developing uh, software and behavioral testing software um, to try to develop the the, uh, the equipment that we needed. Now the problem we had was that and actually this feeds quite well into what I'm going to talk about tonight is that a lot of the work we were doing was based on um, reinforcement contingencies, usually uh, discrete trial learning um, and uh, schedules of reinforcement and so on. Um, now, when you're trying to run experiments that use discrete trial learning, obviously, uh, the animal needs to carry out one trial after another. And in order for that trial to start, there needs to be some form of intervention from the outside world, whether that be automated or whether it be a human being moving a piece of card from one place to another. Now, in order to make that reliable and remove experimenter bias, we worked with some engineers in order to develop some automated equipment. We tried to work with various companies like EtherVision and so on, um, but unfortunately the modules that were needed in order to add to the equipment that we had were prohibitively expensive. 
Um, and eventually we um, were very fortuitous in the fact that we um, started working with a guy who uh, invents and kind of builds uh, behavioral testing equipment. Um, and he was very excited about our zebrafish work. Um, and so much so that he decided to set up a company uh, that was producing automated behavioral equipment for zebrafish. Um, now, I, um, this isn't like a sales pitch, but I'm just informing you of, of what we use for our research now. So um, we were lucky to kind of meet and discuss our options um, and uh, Xantix, which is a company that we use now for all of our behavioral uh, testing equipment, um, produced this kind of uh, uh, multi-level um, uh, kind of very adaptable, flexible testing environment uh, for adult zebrafish, uh, but also for larval zebrafish and also a very large system which can be used for rodents um, or for kind of shoaling uh, work and so on. Um, so really that journey of automation probably took the best part of about seven or eight years to happen, um, but we're now at a stage where actually the automation in our lab um, is uh, central to all we do. And that's really tantamount to the fact that we've um, been able to produce an enormous amount of data really in a relatively short amount of time, something that couldn't really have been done before the days of automation. So um, in terms of memory, one of the first protocols that I used was not something that I uh, came up with myself. This was some work that had been done um, by Michael Granato's group. Um, and this had been done quite some time ago in uh, their own kind of automated setup. Now, what we were interested in um, initially was coming up with a protocol for studying. It wasn't really for studying memory. I must say it was really more for studying Pavlovian conditioning. Um, but we wanted a protocol where we could look at the effects of, uh, for example, um, you know, different drugs or genetic knockouts on um, Pavlovian conditioning experiments. So um, we used the protocol that Granato had come up with in his group um, where we were looking at uh, whether you could condition animals, uh, condition adult zebrafish um, to avoid a particular stimulus after um, a, a Pavlovian conditioning uh, contingency. So in the initial part of this study, um, in the baseline, I seem to have lost my, there we go, um, in the baseline we had a um, you can see the two fish swimming around there. This is slightly sped up, so it looks a bit peculiar, but um, that, that's uh, what happens at baseline. So they swim around for five minutes. After five minutes, the um, the <clears throat> excuse me, the check uh, will move from one side to the other, uh, and then we we uh, assess how long the fish spends um, uh, over the check or the uh, the, the grey stimulus in order to get a kind of baseline assessment. What we do then is we carry out a Pavlovian conditioning protocol whereby we um, condition the fish eight times um, that they will have <clears throat> um, a grey screen, completely grey screen, um, for eight and a half seconds, followed by a one and a half second presentation on the entire screen of the check stimulus. And at the end of that one and a half seconds, there's a electric shock, a very brief electric shock. And we repeat this eight times, as I say. Uh, and then afterwards, um, we test whether the fish has learnt about that uh, particular condition stimulus uh, by looking at their uh, position. And this uh, video on the right uh, demonstrates a fish, uh, two fish that have been conditioned to avoid the uh, to avoid the check stimulus. So you can see that there's a very clear avoidance behaviour within this protocol. And then as we switch the sides, the fish then uh, moves away um, and sits on the other side uh, because it has associated the, uh, the check stimulus with uh, the shock. Now, this is Pavlovian conditioning, not operant conditioning, obviously, because the fish, there are no contingencies that the fish has to avoid a shock. Um, all it's doing is avoiding the uh, potentially harmful stimulus, in our opinion. Now, this is a very nice protocol, very reliable protocol. And actually, um, so this is a, a kind of representative graph on the left here. This is from a bioarchive paper that we published a few years ago when we were first working with the Xantix equipment. Um, and this is the kind of typical um, uh, uh, data that we see, whereby obviously the preference for one side over the other at baseline is roughly 50%. Uh, and then uh, during the probe trial, the final preference assessment trial, uh, the animals show a, a vastly reduced uh, preference for the uh, conditioned stimulus, uh, which just demonstrates that the fish has learned that. And actually, you can use this protocol quite successfully to measure things like retention intervals and so on. So if you extend the gap between um, testing the animal um, after the conditioning, then you can see how long uh, the fish uh, retain that memory of the uh, conditioned stimulus. So it's a fairly flexible protocol. <clears throat> 
the problem is with this protocol and something that we've found um, over the years is that we tend to get fairly strong ceiling effects or floor effects in the sense that because uh, the animals really um, learn this really strongly it's very difficult to um, look at manipulations that would for example increase learning um, because the animals all show such a strong response so because that and, and also if you have very um, I guess subtle um, uh, cognitive manipulations something as strong as conditioning uh, can be rather difficult to look at in terms of the effects that those um, interventions might have so it's not ideal in the sense that it isn't particularly sensitive to um, low level uh, pharmacological or, or genetic or even behavioral manipulations. So we wanted to come up with things that were a little bit more reliable in that sense. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, and really the main focus of this talk is going to be about this uh, FMPY maze. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about what a Y maze is. Now, many of you are probably familiar with Y mazes, and I don't want to um, uh, insult your intelligence by telling you what a Y maze is. It's a, a maze that is shaped like a Y. Um, the Y maze is widely used in many, many animal models. So you can see here in this picture, uh, there's a mouse that is in a Y maze. Now, typically, the Y maze, well, there's various different ways that Y mazes can be used. Um, one such way is um, by looking at whether the animal essentially visits a novel arm or whether they visit the same arm. Now, this is used really based on a combination of spatial cues, so extra maze cues like distal cues on the walls and so on, but also intra maze cues, so things like the animal's um, scent and stuff like that. And actually what happens within a typical Y maze is that the mouse will be placed in a starting arm. And then um, if the, and, and normally they'll look at it over maybe three turns. So what they'll look at is whether the mouse uh, uh, visits a new arm or whether it visits an arm that it's been to before. So in this scenario, if the mouse was to go from the arm that it's currently in, the arm that's kind of northwest, into the south arm, uh, and then from the south arm went into the northeast arm, then that would be called alternation. And what they mean by that is that the animal is alternating between the different arms. So in other words, the spatial location of those arms is what's important. Arm A versus arm B versus arm C. Now that's fine if the animal then went to the same arm. So in other words, if it went from arm one into arm two and then back into arm one again, then they would call that a repetition because they would say that the animal is repeatedly going back to the same arm. Now, our way of conceptualizing the Y maze was slightly different. And the reason that we wanted to do it slightly differently was because it always seemed somewhat unintuitive to look a at such a small number of trials um, but b also not to um, assess the overall kind of strategy of an animal when it's trying to escape an environment if you look at it over a relatively short period of time you know there are lots of reasons why an animal might go back to the same place including scent trails and so on um, but if you put an animal in an environment over a long period of time then it means that the animal is going to have to try lots of different kinds of strategies in order to escape from that environment or indeed to forage within that unknown environment it doesn't really matter which one of those two it's doing to be honest and you'll probably see why in a moment so um, I just want to show you a video of a um, fish within our Y maze, um, if I can. So um, what we do is we look at the way that the animals swim around within the maze. I'm having some uh, computer issues here because I'm not actually able to see my cursor for some reason. Just give me a moment. Oh, there we go. Um, so if you look at this animal, it's um, this is what we would call repetition. So the animal's gone right and then turned right again and then turned right again. So actually within that set of four trials, it did four right turns. In this particular trial now, the animal is going left and then right and then left and then right. Now, the difference with this is that what the animal is doing is not based on the spatial location of the arms. And we know it's not based on the spatial locations of the arms because within our fish version of the Y maze, we do not use any extra maze cues. So there are no cues within the maze. Um, it's also unlikely that there would be olfactory cues within the maze simply because um, the animals are moving around in a relatively small environment. And so any um, chemosensory cues would probably be um, moved around that environment uh, during the swimming behavior. 
Um, now, what we were interested in is instead of thinking about it as in the spatial location of the arms, we were interested in thinking about um, what the animal did at each choice point. Now, we conceptualise the Y maze in terms of a series of T mazes, essentially. So a series of two choice discriminations. So every time the animal reaches that central point, it has to make a decision whether to go left or right. Now, those decisions can either be based on, um, you know, some kind of cue within the maze or it can be based on some kind of internal representation of which way the animal turned last time it came to this choice point. Now, what we do in our lab, as you can see at the bottom there, is we overlap a series of um, choices. So if you look at the bottom of the screen where it says left, left, right, left, right, left, right, so on, um, what we do is we take each set of um, four turns. So the first four would be left, left, right, left. The second four would be left, right, left, right. The third four would be right, left, right, left. The fourth four would be left, right, left, right, and so on. And so what we do is we overlap these four, what we call tetragrams, so that over the entire search period, and we film the animals for an hour, um, we can see what their most common search strategies were. There's a number of mathematical reasons why we use these overlapping tetragrams. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that now because there isn't the time, um, but we've published it in a paper on BioArchive and it's um, currently in, in press or in review or whatever uh, that explains some of the mathematics. But it's based on essentially a Markov choice um, uh, probability, uh, whereby using four choices overlapping um, gives you a better chance of looking at random um, behaviours rather than using two or three uh, choices, essentially. Now, what we see when we look at the fish behaviour over an hour um, is uh, an increase in what we call alternations. Now, alternations are um, turns where the fish will go left, right, left, right, or right, left, right, left. Um, and um, we saw that within that maze um, that you get a much higher number of alternations than any other behaviour. So we wanted to know whether alternations were related to working memory. And the reason we wanted to know this, and the reason this seemed like a sensible hypothesis, was because if the animals were using a particular strategy more often, it would make sense that in order to employ that as a strategy, the animal must have some representation of what it did on the last trial in order to do something different on the subsequent trial. So in terms of working memory, we're talking about a process by which the animal is um, performing a behaviour that relies on a memory of the previous behaviour that was done. And if it doesn't have that memory, if it's not based on memory, then there's no reason to think that the animal will do anything other than random search. Now, um, this particular paper is based on um, Madeline Cleal is leading the group uh, on this particular uh, paper. Um, uh, Barbara, who I've mentioned already and who you all know is leading the conference, has done a lot of work with this as well. But this particular project is, is Madeline's um, uh, first author paper. So that's why I'm telling her. Um, so what you'll see from this um, initial graph here is um, a representation of the different uh, potential tetragrams within that Y maze. Now, if the fish were performing um, randomly, then you would expect to see um, chance performance, which would be around 6% on each of these tetragrams. But as you can cl clearly see, um, there are two that go way above that. Um, actually, repetitions, the left, 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 and right, 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 right are also usually slightly higher than chance in terms of statistical significance. Um, and we're going to talk more about repetitions later on in this talk. Um, however, uh, the left, right, left, right, and right, left, right, left alternations were by far the highest that we see. And actually, this is um, very, very consistent. And we see this um, pretty much every time we run the Y maze. So this was something that we, we saw for, you know, throughout our early studies. Now, in order to test the hypothesis that these um, alternations were related to working memory, um, we used a pharmacological manipulation by blocking um, uh, uh, by uh, blocking glutamate and also uh, by uh, using scopolamine to block muscarinic receptors. So by blocking these um, uh, different uh, memory related processes, as you can see, 
uh, we were able to um, essentially block the number of alternations that the animals were doing. Um, in the case of the higher uh, concentration of um, MK801, which is the glutamate antagonist, uh, we blocked uh, memory altogether, so removed it, uh, br brought it down to chance levels. And scopolamine has a, a significant reduction in, in memory, um, uh, although not quite as strong as MK801, certainly at the concentrations that we used. So based on these data and based on the logic of the fact that if an animal is performing a strategy we're fairly confident um, in this first instance that what we're looking at with the alternations is related to a working memory process so the next thing we wanted to know is well okay it, this is great fish do this uh, alternation behavior within the fmp y maze but what about other vertebrates and what about invertebrates indeed but what about other vertebrates So in the first um, picture on the left hand side, you can see within the Xantix unit, this is um, two fish uh, swimming around. I just wanted to show you this because obviously I showed you the uh, repetitions and alternations. But this this shows you that the fish don't just kind of sit in the same two, uh, uh, you know, two arms the whole time. They are kind of searching around. But what we find is that in around, you know, somewhere between uh, 20 and 40 percent of the trials, they will uh, use these alternation strategies. So this is a, a fish uh, carrying out the um, Y maze. And in the second video here, we have a mouse. So um, we used uh, the other, the large Xantix unit, the LT unit. Um, uh, we had a, a larger Y maze built for mice because again, we wanted to see what kinds of patterns of exploration mice used within the same maze. And so this is a mouse kind of searching around within the Y maze. And so, um, again, as you can see, similar to what we see with the zebra fish, uh, the mice kind of move around and search around and make decisions about where to go. And again, both mice and zebrafish were filmed for an hour within the maze. And these are the data. Um, so the top graph on the left hand side is the, um, uh, the tetragrams of zebrafish that I've already shown you. Um, and the graph at the bottom is the same uh, data from mice. And so as you can see, um, uh, you know, really clearly, um, we see exactly the same patterns of search behavior within the uh, within the FMP Y maze with uh, fish and with mice, which is really nice to know because essentially it tells us that the, you know, the behaviors that we're looking at seem to be something that is fairly well conserved um, throughout vertebrate species. One thing that is worth noting actually with mice is that um, something that we see with zebrafish more um, is increased repetitions. Um, I have a theory for why that is, and I will share that theory with you later when we're talking more about repetitions. Um, but at the moment, it is worth noting that you do get slightly more repetitions with zebrafish than you do with mice. But the alternations is always the same. So the next thing we wanted to know is, well, OK, if we see this in um, vertebrates like zebrafish and mice, what do we see in humans? Um, so we did a uh, Y maze with humans. Um, we used a virtual Y maze. Um, the top right hand side uh, is what we call the honeycomb setup. The one we use is a lot larger than this. This is just illustrative. Um, and this is what it's like for somebody searching through. So as you can see, there's a series of Y mazes uh, where the person using a computer um, has to search their way through the maze. Um, and uh, in reality, there's no way out. They just keep doing this forever. But by using a horizon, it makes it look to the person like they are getting towards some sort of exit. Um, and so people search around that Y maze. Uh, for humans, we don't make them do it for an hour. We felt that that would be unnecessarily cruel. Um, however, we make them do it for five minutes. And actually what we find is that within five minutes, um, we get sufficient data from humans um, in order to run the analyses and so on. So five minutes is, is probably enough. So this is some data from humans. Um, amazingly, humans seem to be a little bit more like zebrafish than they are like uh, mice, um, which is quite interesting. Um, but as you'll notice uh, very clearly, um, humans uh, show uh, the very same patterns uh, that zebrafish and mice do, uh, with um, an increase in alternations in their behavior throughout that testing period. Um, and a very slight increase in repetitions. Um, although I, what we tend to find with repetitions is that there tend to be certain individuals that do very, very high numbers of repetitions. Again, we'll come back to that a bit later. OK, so as a kind of interim summary of the first half of the talk, or the first part of the talk, really, um, 
from what we've seen so far, the FMP Y maze does seem to be very useful uh, for studying working memory because uh, we know that it's um, both logically and based on our pharmacology, uh, we know that it is um, a memory pattern, the alternations, um, and vertebrates, including humans, show comparable search patterns, which means that we have a test that has um, very high translational relevance. Um, and you can probably envisage already um, what kinds of things this potential, this test could be used for. Uh, for example, if we're looking at zebrafish models of uh, neurodegenerative disorders or even some of the neuropsychiatric or neurodevelopmental disorders that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it may be that the FMPY maze is a very useful tool to use, especially as we're able, after looking at zebrafish, to go and look at whether humans that share those conditions have similar kinds of um, disruptions to their search patterns as the humans do. And of course, this is something that, that's currently underway in my group. So the next question that we were interested in is, well, okay, we have this FMPY maze, which is great. It works really nicely with adults and we're able to see um, performance of adults in this which is really great because we're able to potentially use um, adult zebrafish for doing some of our uh, uh, kind of translational work that we do in the lab but one of the things that was um, uh, kind of uh, I guess troubling me a little bit or at least um, something that I really wanted to know the answer to was um, a would we be able to use this in larvae so at least in younger zebrafish because obviously if you have to grow the animals up we test in our lab usually between three and six months depending on what we're doing um, and you know somewhere around three or four months many labs do um if we could do it in larvae a it would be great in terms of um, increasing the throughput but also in terms of the three r's in terms of reducing the use of adult zebrafish um we could potentially have a situation if we could use larvae where we wouldn't need to use um adult zebrafish so this was something that was really important and i think we we, we decided quite early on that we wanted to have a look into the use of larvae for this now, we ran a, um, a test with larvae. Um, in fact, we did a, a full kind of ontogeny study with fish right the way from uh, four days post fertilization, right the way up to 24 months post fertilization. Um, I'm just going to go through this bit by bit because there's a lot of data here. Um, the first thing that we found was that the four day post fertilization larvae, I put the, the graph in there for reference, but really the data were pretty much unusable. Um, we weren't really able, they just don't move enough, as many of you will know. Um, four day post fertilization larvae just don't really move very much. And so uh, the likelihood is that the four day old guys were just really not going to be any use to us, which was a shame because, I mean, we tried various different ways of doing it, tried to stimulate the them with um, uh, light and sound and, and stuff like that but we just didn't get sufficient movement to, to really get any kind of useful data um, and you know so there were lots of zero values and it's it's kind of meaningless um, the next thing you'll notice is that the peak performance as you'll see from graph b was in the six month adults that was roughly where we saw the sort of peak performance and that's the kinds of um, alternation numbers that i showed you on that original graph so again we, we see that every time but just to sort of you know show you that that's what we see um in the bottom uh, on graph c down there you'll see the um uh, the alternations as a function of age now, again, probably ignore the four day post fertilization because it really wasn't very useful. Um, however, the seven day post fertilization, we do start seeing um, alternations right from that very early stage. Um, now, what's quite nice about this is that um, if potentially if people wanted to use larvae for um, memory type research, it looks from our data like it's quite possible to do them at seven days. Interestingly, we saw a huge spike and bear in mind these sample sizes for this are very large. We're using you know in excess of 60 fish per, per age group or more for some of the older ages. Um, for the uh, six, for the seven days and the 14 days, we saw a big spike um, from seven to 14 days. We're not sure what this is. It may be uh, related to, um, you know, some kind of search strategy relating to the age, whether perhaps they're um, at a particular part of the ontogeny where they're 
you know, susceptible to uh, predation or something when they're leaving the, uh, the sort of relative safety of the base of the river or something. But for some reason, we saw a very, very high um, number of, of, of alternations within our 14 day group. Um, we then jumped to one month. So we kind of doubled every time um, we moved to one month and we saw um, dropped a little bit back to what we saw with the uh, seven days. Uh, we then saw in our three month guys, um, roughly the same as what we'd seen in 14. A again, it peaked at six months. Obviously, it wasn't significantly different from three months, but it is slightly higher. Uh, and we started to see a reduction at 12 months. And I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes. But um, what was quite interesting is that once the fish had kind of peaked at six months um, and their uh, decline started, if you like, um, we only really saw a decline in alternations. So if you look at the repetitions on the right hand graph, um, that kind of stays at a reasonably similar level. So once you get up to um, three or six months, the, the repetition side of it um, stays relatively similar, slightly above chance. Now, what's quite nice about this and um, where we're kind of going with this is that it's possible that the 24 month old zebrafish are starting to show uh, the signs of cognitive decline um, and actually I've been working with a, a collaborator um, in Australia um, uh, Michael Lardelli who some of you may know um, who's interested in Alzheimer's disease and early onset Alzheimer's disease um, in particular um, and we've been using this protocol to, to test some of his Alzheimer's lines and we're finding some quite interesting data actually from that which will be published in due course. So um, it seems that um, zebrafish similar to other mammals um, not only show um, uh, uh, changes or uh, I guess um, adaptations within their memory through the uh, through development but also start to show the signs of cognitive decline in older age and obviously 24 months old for a zebrafish is, is fairly old um, by most stretches of the imagination um, we are growing them up to be even older than that and we'll be interested to see whether that decline continues into extreme old age now Based on that idea that we could potentially use the FMP Y maze to study aging related cognitive decline, um, we wanted to look at whether if you were if you treated um, a an older zebrafish with a drug that was known to reduce cognitive decline or at least was known to improve cognitive performance, so a cognitive enhancing drug, to what extent would that improve the aging related cognitive decline? So we used a uh, D1 agonist in order to look at what impact that would have. A D1 agonists are well known to be uh, uh, cognitive enhancers and have been shown in a variety of different species uh, to be cognitively enhancing. Um, and as you'll notice, uh, the 24 month old guys in terms of their alternations, um, as we showed you before, showed a reduction. But this was rescued by the uh, D1 agonist. So, again, this is part of some ongoing work that we're doing, um, but it does seem likely that not only can we use uh, aging zebrafish within the Y maze to look at cognitive decline, but also that we're able to rescue, to a certain extent, the, um, the cognitive decline that we're seeing uh, with agents that we see um, uh, rescuing cognitive decline in other vertebrates. Now, as well as looking specifically at memory and to look at the way that the um, FMP Y maze can be used to study memory, we're also interested to know whether um, we could use the FMP Y maze to study other aspects of behaviour. We decided this might be a useful tool for laterality bias. Um, there's a lot of evidence that laterality um, and left and right bias and uh, physical and cognitive and motor laterality um, are related to um, neuropsychiatric conditions, but also related to basic memory and cognition. Um, and so what we wanted to know was whether we could use the Y maze in a useful way uh, to look at um, alterations within motor laterality, because it seemed fairly clear that um, obviously this would be an easy way of picking it up. So um, the first thing that Barbara did was to um, look at whether uh, zebrafish generally, based on our, our work that we've done so far, so we had a huge uh, bank of data on this, um, showed any particular left or right bias. And as you can see from these data, um, the answer is no, they didn't. Um, most of the animals, around 45% of the animals, show absolutely no bias whatsoever. Um, and the remaining uh, two thirds of the animals, um, so 30% right and 30% left. So 
we were not particularly um, uh, concerned with this actually because obviously if we looked at this and found that 80% of them were right bias and that might have been slightly concerning but uh, we were actually quite pleased with this because we thought well actually look if you've got um, the majority that don't show this particular bias it might be that we can use the, the extremes the ends of the distribution in order to get some really interesting information about um, other aspects of behavior um, so we published a paper in Animal Cognition, I guess last year or the year before, um, where we were looking into whether behavioural laterality could predict other aspects of behaviour. And so what we did was we looked first at what the laterality indices were within the Y maze. Um, and so first of all, we screened um, a very large number of fish uh, to look at what the kind of inherent laterality was. And we found that most of the fish were um, uh, non bias um, And again, some of them were left bias and some were right. The animals that were right bias seemed to move a lot less, so they seemed potentially a little bit more cautious within the maze, but they certainly showed fewer turns overall. Um, they also showed um, a significantly higher number of uh, repetitions within the maze and significantly fewer alternations. So this suggested not only that they might have had, so this is left and right bias, um, not only that they might have had kind of reduced cognitive ability based on our um, previous work, uh, but also that the animals that were left to right bias might be showing increased kind of stereotypic type behaviours. So we haven't really talked about this yet, but this idea of um, kind of repetitive habitual behaviour, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later on, um, started to come out in this paper. And if you look at the bottom at the um, tetragrams for all of the animals, you'll notice that, I mean, not surprisingly, the right bias and left bias guys show higher numbers of repetition within the left and right. Um, you could argue, well, that's a circular problem. But I would argue that it's not, because actually, if you look at the total number, um, it's roughly double what you would see uh, by random. So it's not like they're always just going left or always just going right. They're just showing a bias towards those repetitive left or right turns. Now, what was really interesting about this is that when we then looked at these animals on a different behavioral protocol, so we looked at them in the... Um, uh, conditioning, uh, uh, condition the one that I showed you at the beginning, the, the fear conditioning, what we found actually was that the left and right bias guys showed an increased fear response within our um, uh, Pavlovian conditioning protocol. So it did seem to suggest that actually um, the um, uh, uh, avoidance memory, if you like, seemed to be shower, uh, shower, seemed to be stronger in the guys that showed uh, left and right bias. And this was really interesting because it was the first time that a laterality bias had actually predicted something else about learning. Um, since then, we have tended to think about the possibility that um, laterality might impact on other aspects of, um, of conditioning and learning. And this is something that um, Barbara has been thinking about a lot and is likely to, to put into some uh, work in the future. Um, another study that we carried out, this was with Madeline. This was actually before Barbara joined us. This was looking at um, a zebrafish that had been treated with um, alcohol early in life. So what we did was we, um, uh, we've, we've published a few papers on this before, but I was interested in whether you'd be able to pick up subtle differences in uh, memory uh, with animals that had been um, given a very low concentration of ethanol um, when they were developing. So it's a, a kind of model of um, uh, of kind of moderate, low to moderate um, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. So with fetal alcohol syndrome, um, if the mother drinks alcohol during pregnancy, um, there's a whole range of, of, uh, of cognitive, behavioural, even morphological um, abnormalities that are seen in the offspring. Um, but what we do is we use a very low amount of alcohol, which would mimic, um, you know, a human, for example, maybe drinking a glass of wine each day when they're pregnant. That's kind of the levels that we use. Um, and what we do is we look at more subtle behavioural outcomes. So previously we've looked at this in terms of um, propensity towards um, drug addiction and so on. Uh, but we wanted to look at it in terms of memory because there is some evidence that uh, children that have been exposed to low levels of alcohol during pregnancy might have uh, more subtle cognitive differences. And actually, as we can see here from the um, lower graph, um, the, the, the number of alternations in our animals that have been treated with uh, 20 millimolar ethanol um, during early development was actually reduced, suggesting that there might have been some kind of, um, uh, uh, I guess, degradation, if you like, in this very subtle um, uh, sort of uh, alternation, this 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 memory um, 
uh, ability. Now, what was nice about this was that actually we've tried a number of different other memory protocols with um, animals that have been treated with very low amounts of alcohol, um, and we've not really had sensitive enough measures to pick it up. Um, and so if we were trying to look for, um, for example, drugs that could be used to help people that had, um, uh, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome, but a very moderate, so fetal alcohol spectrum disorders after moderate exposure, it would be difficult to do that with the protocols that we had. But with the Y maze, um, we were able to do so um, by using the um, by using the alternation protocol. Now, um, I've mentioned this a few times. So for the last couple of minutes of this talk, I just want to mention repetitions because I have been mentioning it quite a lot. And I just want to finish with um, some repetitions because this is something that I'm really getting quite interested in. Um, so just to give some background, um, this this idea of repetitive behavior um, really stems from uh, work on kind of habit formation and stereotypic responding. So this idea of repetitive behaviors, behaviors that people do over and over again. And this is based uh, mainly on uh, a lot of early work by Anne Grabiel at MIT and colleagues, but also various other people as well over the years. Um, the early stages of learning, as we know, when we first learn about a stimulus, tend to be a lot more cognitive and actually involve response outcome learning. So learning about the relationship and representations of the relationship uh, between the response that you're making and the outcome. Um, later on in learning, um, this tends to be become more habitual, more automatized. Um, in other words, uh, once you get into a situation where you have a well-learned behavior and you know what to do in that situation, your responses become uh, uh, unrelated to the outcome. And we know that based on huge amounts of work, um, again, starting by people like Tony Dickinson and Anne Grabiel, um, where they looked at, um, uh, you know, what happens if you devalue the outcome, how that impacts on um, operant responding and so on. But also it's been done um, uh, many times since in lots of different scenarios. Um, the other thing we know about habit formation is that it is increased by stress, especially chronic, uh, especially acute stress, but also chronic stress. And we also know that it's mediated by midbrain dopamine activity. So really, um, two things that we've been interested in in this is what happens if we manipulate stress, what happens to kind of habitual behavior, um, and also, you know, to what extent does this rely on, on dopaminergic activity? And so what we wanted to do was to see whether, A, we could use the uh, Y maze to manipulate repetitions, uh, and B, whether uh, dopamine would then have any impact on that. Um, so this work was um, done by Barbara and um, is uh, currently uh, being analysed and we hope will be uh, um, sent for publication fairly soon. So what Barbara did was to um, use a couple of different stressors. Um, one was net chasing and one was the presence of alarm substance. Um, we've decided not to use net chasing because net chasing produces uh, very kind of atypical responses, um, probably because of the amount of um, uh, energy that's being exploited. So when you look at things like cortisol and so on, it's not as clean, the data. So although we saw um, uh, re results for net chasing, uh, the data were never as clean and not, not quite as useful. So um, alarm substance seemed to induce the best stress response based on our other measures. Um, so in terms of the repetitions, we saw a significant increase in repetitions for the alarm substance, but not for the net chasing. Uh, and we also saw that the, um, uh, so that would suggest that um, stress did increase repetitions, as we predicted. Um, we also saw that this was reduced by the um, D1 agonist. So uh, by alarm substance, we saw that there was um, a, a kind of reversal of that, of that particular um, repetition by D1 agonist. We also saw, which was quite interesting, that the alarm substance uh, um, increased laterality, um, but actually that laterality, um, so I put those graphs in the wrong order, um, so it increased laterality, but um, the uh, laterality was also reduced or um, completely removed by the D1 agonist. So what was quite nice in these data, um, and again, we're, we're still under uh, doing the analyses. These are kind of preliminary analyses, and we have some um, uh, uh, qPCRs and so on to, to add to this as well once they're all done. Um, what's quite nice about this is first that we've been able to see that the Y maze might be able to be used to measure kind of stereotypic repetitive responding, and that that is related to stress, and also um, that it increases laterality and that it seems to be rescued by, um, or at least it seems to be under the control of the dopamine system. So um, to give a conclusion, because I am 
at time and ready to finish. Um, the FMP Ymaze is a simple non-invasive automated test of working memory and we've uh, demonstrated both interspecies and translational relevance to humans. Um, it also potentially based on our data from uh, what we've looked at in terms of the um, uh, other aspects of behavior uh, may be able to give us um, potential to look translationally at a broad range of um, orders, disorders such as uh, neuropsychiatric, neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental. Um, also, it's really important to look at subtle individual differences um, when you're looking at experiments relating to memory, but also potentially to habit and stereotypic behavior. So we're able to look at these very subtle differences within this test, um, something that our tests in the past haven't really been able to do. So it just remains for me to thank uh, my team, um, especially um, for this work, Barbara and Madeline. So Madeline Cleal and Barbara Fontana, who you know, of course, um, but also collaborators, um, Will Norton. I've not talked about a lot of work that Will and I have done tonight. I think Barbara is going to be talking about that at some point, potentially or not. I don't know. Uh, but also, of course, Caroline Brennan from Queen Mary. Um, I also want to thank Bill Budenberg, um, who is the uh, guy who started Xantix, um, without whom uh, none of that automation work would have been possible. Um, and Bill you know spent a lot of years um, uh, developing that equipment and um, uh, definitely reserved deserves a huge amount of praise for that um, also our technical staff Jess Charlotte and Andy and various others over the year and all of the funders that have uh, played a role in funding the research that um, I've presented tonight so thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions that people might have